Let me ask you if you could, just because there's there is definitely a generational issue in terms of the people who are in this chat and are watching. So if you could just briefly give it like the, the synopsis of what the population bomb was about, what, what you're, what you were talking about back then. And then we could talk about what has happened and, and where it has ended up now. Well, what I was talking about back then is very similar to what all scientists are talking about now. <laughs> Namely, you cannot grow anything forever. Uh, on a finite planet, uh, and the Rachel Carson had basically introduced environmental problems to the American public. There was stuff before that, but the literature hadn't taken hold the way Rachel's did. But uh, she did not really discuss in any detail the population dimension of the problem, and uh, I had been emphasizing that that should not be ignored. Uh, uh, people will say, the only thing I care about, but that's their interpretation. The the book, The Population Bomb, the original title that we gave to Ian Ballantyne, who invented the pocket book when we wrote it, uh, at his request, by the way, he uh, we called it Population Resources Environment. Uh, and that is still the basic story. It's not all population. It's uh, the, the biggest problem is overall consumption. And of course, how much you consume um, is a product that is a multiplication of how many people there are and how much each individual on average consumes. And a third factor was added by us along in 1970, I think, pointing out that it also depended on what technologies you used to, uh, to service the consumption. It's very, very simple. It's something that every scientist who has an IQ of over 20 understands. Uh, unhappily, most politicians don't have that high an IQ. Uh, and so we're still in the kind of trouble we were in back then, except with much less time to do anything about it. Yeah. I really think uh, this is an important conversation because the misconception that a lot of people have when it comes to the issue of overpopulation. Like it's a, a myth. Well, somebody well, said, oh, overpopulation is a myth. Not even so much that it's a myth, it's this idea that it's, they're thinking about it in terms of general land mass. But as you know, most of the population centers center in very specific areas. We are in South Florida, you are in the Bay Area. There are, uh, to, to say that it's overpopulated is saying it in a very kind way. Um, you know, California is a, is a probably an even better example than Florida. Florida is massively overpopulated, especially all over the coastlines. Uh, California has the same problem. I think it's like, it, it, and quote me, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. If, if it's like 80 to 90 percent of California's population is within 10 miles of the coastline, all the way from the top end of the state down to the bottom. Yeah, um, but you're you're missing a basic point. That is. The coastline of California, Florida is going to go underwater. Uh, we all know that, but it's not going to go fast. You're going to be able to outwalk it if you're on the Florida thing. But the issue is not people versus space. It's people versus resources, and the resources include the garbage cans, like the atmosphere where we're putting all the carbon, uh, and the uh, resources include the groundwater that you were mentioning. And what's going to happen from climate disruption, which is just – one of the existential threats we face uh, is, yes, sea level is certainly going to rise as it gets warmer. That's basic physics. But much more important is it's already hitting agriculture. We have a population now of uh, on the world of almost 8 billion people, of which roughly 3 billion can't afford to eat well enough uh, to be actually functional. Whereas somewhere in the vicinity of 600 to 800 million are actually starving. Uh, and now we are attacking agriculture. And agriculture, the food system on the planet, is responsible for about a third of the greenhouse gases that go into the atmosphere. So as we try to increase our food supply, we are attacking our climate. And anybody who has a garden or a tropical fishbowl knows that uh, organisms are tuned, have evolved to fit into certain temperature zones. When you change the temperature very rapidly, you screw up agriculture. And that's what we're in the process of doing, and that's what the data show. A paper by uh, on this general topic just last year had 15,000 scientists sign on to it. 
but it was the second edition of one that we produced back in the early 1990s. The situation has not changed significantly since the population bomb, uh, except we just had four years of the most incompetent administration the world has ever seen in the leading nation, yeah. which set us way, way back. So I would say in some ways, uh, we were pushed back before 1968, but at least in 1968, we still had the potential to do something about it. End of yeah. sermon. No, no, it's true. And <laughs> I'm here for it, my friend. I and, am here you know, for look, it. there's there's also, you know, and that doesn't even, you know, you talk about um, food production. Uh, we also have a significant military industrial complex um, contribution to our climate crisis that's very massive. But on the food issue, we lack sustainability in agricultural practices all over because sustainable agriculture is not as profitable as industrialized agriculture. And we would all be better off if we were all sustainably farming, gardening, living, you know, more plant-based lives. Actually, um, a, a scientist named Claire Kremen uh, published a year or so ago a really interesting study which shows that you could actually uh, produce as much food with a reasonable agricultural system than with the present industrial one, whether we'll ever do it. I mean, the, the big issue isn't could we change our ways in such a way as to make it possible for, our, for my great-grandchildren uh, to live in a decent world? And the answer is probably yes. Will we do it? Uh, when I look around and I see, for example, that people are fighting over whether to wear masks, when you realize that in order to deal with the existential threats of which climate change is just one, uh, you're going to have to change your entire culture. You're going to have to not have a totally financialized uh, uh, system of e economics and economics departments in most universities totally lacking anyone who has a clue about how the world works. Uh, the changes that are going to be required are so dramatic and the response to very sensible things like mask wearing is so stupid uh, that I uh, I can't be totally optimistic. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, people are not exactly really very sharp. We're 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 creating policy out of profit and fear instead of you know reason, and so that's always problematic. And it's interesting because the mask thing is the one that's the no brainer to me because of all the COVID stuff that we've been talking about. That's the one thing we know for sure works. When you cover yeah. your face and the germs don't spread, it helps. That's yeah, why we've no had less flu. That's why everybody has been less sick in general, not just COVID. But this year, there's been like very low flu um, outbreaks. So we know it works. Uh, but yeah, people just don't want to wrap their heads around it. All right. We'll dive. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.